Greetings and welcome back to 303. We continue now with our study and analysis of uh, Porter's The Jilting of Granny uh, Wetherill. And we're uh, in your hymnals on 838. Um, we're going to now get to the part of the story where we begin to pay attention to the title of the story. The Jilting of Granny Witherall. There's a, there's a plot line that's going to be a part of the past. And through a series of flashbacks, we're going to begin to understand something happened to her long before her kids, long before meeting John, all of the things that constitute her life as her life. We'll begin on page 838 and the top. It made her feel like rolling up her sleeves. Let's go back to our professional reader now again. Rolling up her sleeves and putting the whole place to rights again. No matter if Cornelia was determined to be everywhere at once, there were a great many things left undone on this place. She would start tomorrow and do them. It was good to be strong enough for everything, even if all you made melted and changed and slipped under your hands, so that by the time you finished, you almost forgot what you were working for. What was it I set out to do? She asked herself intently, but she could not remember. A fog rose over the valley. She saw it marching across the creek, swallowing the trees and moving up the hill like an army of ghosts. Soon it would be at the near edge of the orchard, and then it was time to go in and light the lamps. Come in, children. Don't stay out in the night air. Lighting the lamps had been beautiful. The children huddled up to her, and breathed like little calves waiting at the bars in the twilight. A flashback. Their eyes followed the match and watched the flame rise and settle in a blue curve. Then they moved away from her. The lamp was lit. They didn't have to be scared and hang on to mother anymore. Never. Never. Never more. God, for all my life I thank thee. Without thee, my God, I could never have done it. Hail Mary, full of grace. I want you to pick all the fruit this year and see that nothing is wasted. There's always someone who can use it. Don't let good things rot for want of using. You waste life when you waste good food. Don't let things get lost. It's bitter to lose things. Now, don't let me get to thinking. Not when I am tired and taking a little nap before supper. The pillow rose about her shoulders and pressed against her heart, and the memory was being squeezed out of it. Oh, pushed on the pillow, somebody. It would smother her if she tried to hold it. Such a fresh breeze blowing and such a green day with no threats in it. But he had not come just the same. All right, here we go. What does a woman do when she has put on the white veil and set out the white cake for a man, and he doesn't come? She tried to remember. No, I swear he never harmed me but in that. He never harmed me but in that. And what if he did? There was the day. The day. But a whirl of dark smoke rose and covered it, crept up and over into the bright field where everything was planted so carefully in orderly rows. That was hell. She knew hell when she saw it. For 60 years she had prayed against remembering him and against losing her soul in the deep pit of hell. And now the two things were mingled in one and the thought of him was a smoky cloud from hell that moved and crept in her head when she had just got rid of Dr. Harry and was trying to rest a minute. Wounded vanity, Ellen, said a sharp voice in the top of her mind. Don't let your wounded vanity get the upper hand of you. Plenty of girls get jilted. You were jilted, weren't you? Then stand up to it. 
Her eyelids wavered and let in streamers of blue-gray light like tissue paper over her eyes. She must get up and pull the shades down or she'd never sleep. She was in bed again and the shades were not down. How could that happen? Better turn over, hide from the light. Sleeping in the light gave you nightmares. Mother, how do you feel now? And the stinging wetness on her forehead. But I don't like having my face washed in cold water. Hapsy? George? Lydia? The names of her, ch of her children, right? No. Cornelia and her features were swollen and full of little puddles. They're coming, darling. They'll all be here soon. Go wash your face, child. You look funny. Instead of obeying, Cornelia knelt down and put her head on the pillow. She seemed to be talking, but there was no sound. Well, are you tongue-tied? Whose birthday is it? Are you going to give a party? Cornelia's mouth moved urgently in strange shapes. Don't do that. You bother me, daughter. Oh, no, mother. Oh, no. Nonsense. It was strange about children. They disputed your every word. No, what, Cornelia? Here's Dr. Harry. I won't see that boy again. He just left five minutes ago. That was this morning, Mother. It's night now. Here's the nurse. This is Dr. Harry, Mrs. Weatherall. I never saw you look so young and happy. Ha, huh, I'll never be young again, but I'd be happy if they'd let me lie in peace and get rested. She thought she spoke up loudly, but no one answered. A warm weight on her forehead a warm bracelet on her wrist, and the breeze went on whispering, trying to tell her something. A shuffle of leaves in the everlasting hand of God. He blew on them, and they danced and rattled. Mother, don't mind. We're going to give you a little hypodermic. Look here, daughter. How do ants get in this bed? I saw sugar ants yesterday. Did you send for Hapsy too? It was Hapsy she really wanted. She had to go a long way back through a great many rooms to find Hapsy, standing with a baby on her arm. She seemed to herself to be Hapsy also, and the baby on Hapsy's arm was Hapsy, and himself and herself all at once, and there was no surprise in the meeting. Then, Hapsy melted from within and turned flimsy as gray gauze, and the baby was a gauzy shadow, and Hapsy came up close and said, I thought you'd never come, and looked at her very searchingly and said, You haven't changed a bit. They leaned forward to kiss when Cornelia began whispering from a long way off. Oh, is there anything you want to tell me? Is there anything I can do for you? Yes. She had changed her mind after 60 years, and she would like to see George. All right, so here we go. We now come to the heart of the story, the title of the story, the jilting of Granny Weatherall. Notice how there's this dancing movement between the present, when she's laying in a bed dying, and the past, where all these memories are coming up right in her mind over and over again, all this stuff. And notice how much of it has to do with her children and trying to come to terms with the fact that her children were such an integral part of her life, along with, obviously, her devout religious nature. And then there's this story, right? This person, this George, who jilted her, left her at the altar when they were about to get married. Let's study I want you to find George. Find him and be sure to tell him I forgot him. I want him to know I had my husband just the same and my children and my house like any other woman. A good house too and a good husband that I loved and fine children out of him. 
better than I hoped for even. Tell him I was given back everything he took away and more. Oh no. Oh God. No, there was something else besides the house and the man and the children. Oh, surely they were not all. What was it? Something not given back. Her breath crowded down under her ribs and grew into a monstrous, frightening shape with cutting edges. It bored up into her head, and the agony was unbelievable. Yes, John, get the doctor now. No more talk. My time has come. The question, obviously, of the story has often been, what is this that she says something not given back, something lost, never to return. And usually the answer is something related to Granny's capacity to have faith, maybe in other people, maybe in, in a man, um, or in the future. That is to say, so disillusioned by being left at the altar that she never was able to fully recover from the experience. All right, let's go ahead now and finish up the reading of the story. When this one was born, it should be the last. The last. Bottom of page 840. It should have been born first, for it was the one she had truly wanted. Everything came in good time. Nothing left out, left over. She was strong. In three days, she would be as well as ever. Better. A woman needed milk in her to have her full health. Mother? Do you hear me? Now we're back in the present. I've been telling you. Mother, Father Connolly's here. The priest. I went to Holy Communion only last week. Tell him I'm not so sinful as all that. Father just wants to speak to you. He could speak as much as he pleased. It was like him to drop in and inquire about her soul as if it were a teething baby and then stay on for a cup of tea and a round of cards and gossip. He always had a funny story of some sort, usually about an Irishman who made his little mistakes and confessed them, and the point lay in some absurd thing he would blurt out in the confessional showing his struggles between native piety and original sin. Granny felt easy about her soul. Cornelia, where are your manners? Give Father Connolly a chair. She had her secret, comfortable understanding with a few favorite saints who cleared a straight road to God for her. All as surely signed and sealed as the papers for the new 40 acres. Forever. Heirs and assigns forever. Since the day the wedding cake was not cut but thrown out and wasted. The whole bottom dropped out of the world, and there she was, blind and sweating, with nothing under her feet and the walls falling away. His hand had caught her under the breast. She had not fallen. There was the freshly polished floor with the green rug on it, just as before. He had cursed like a sailor's parrot and said, I'll kill him for you. Don't lay a hand on him for my sake. Leave something to God. Now, Ellen, you must believe what I tell you. So there was nothing. Nothing to worry about anymore. Except sometimes in the night, one of the children screamed in a nightmare, and they both hustled out, shaking and hunting for the matches and calling, There, wait a minute, here we are. John, get the doctor now. Hapsy's time has come. But there was Hapsy standing by the bed in a white cap. Cornelia, tell Hapsy to take off her cap. I can't see her plain. Her eyes opened very wide, and the room stood out like a picture she had seen somewhere. Dark colors with the shadows rising toward the ceiling in long angles. The tall black dresser gleamed with nothing on it but John's picture, enlarged from a little one, with John's eyes very black when they should have been blue. You never saw him, so how do you know how he looked? But the man insisted the copy was perfect. It was very rich and handsome. For a picture, yes, 
but it's not my husband. The table by the bed had a linen cover and a candle and a crucifix. The light was blue from Cornelia's silk lampshades. No sort of light at all, just frippery. You had to live 40 years with kerosene lamps to appreciate honest electricity. She felt very strong, and she saw Dr. Harry with a rosy nimbus around him. You look like a saint, Dr. Harry, and I vow that's as near as you'll ever come to it. She sang something. I heard you, Cornelia. What's all this carrying on? Father Connolly sang... Cornelia's voice staggered and bumped like a cart in a bad road. It rounded corners and turned back again and arrived nowhere. Granny stepped up in the cart very lightly and reached for the reins. But a man sat beside her and she knew him by his hands driving the cart. She did not look in his face, for she knew without seeing, but looked instead down the road where the trees leaned over and bowed to each other, and a thousand birds were singing a mass. She felt like singing too, but she put her hand in the bosom of her dress and pulled out a rosary, and Father Connolly murmured Latin in a very solemn voice and tickled her feet. My God, will you stop that nonsense? I'm a married woman. What if he did run away and leave me to face the priest by myself? I found another, a whole world better. I wouldn't have exchanged my husband for anybody except St. Michael himself, and you may tell him that for me with a thank you in the bargain. Light flashed on her closed eyelids, and a deep roaring shook her. Cornelia, is that lightning? I hear thunder. There's going to be a storm. Close all the windows. Call the children in. Mother, here we are, all of us. Is that you, Hapsy? Oh, no, I'm Lydia. We drove as fast as we could. Their faces drifted above her, drifted away. The rosary fell out of her hands, and Lydia put it back. Jimmy tried to help. Their hands fumbled together and Granny closed two fingers around Jimmy's thumb. Beads wouldn't do. It must be something alive. She was so amazed her thoughts ran round and round. So, my dear Lord, this is my death, and I wasn't even thinking about it. My children have come to see me die. But I can't. It's not time. Oh, I always hated surprises. I wanted to give Cornelia the amethyst set. Cornelia, you're to have the amethyst set, but Hapsy's to wear it when she wants. And Dr. Harry, do shut up. Nobody's sent for you. Oh, my dear Lord, do wait a minute. I meant to do something about the 40 acres. Jimmy doesn't need it, and Lydia will later on with that worthless husband of hers. I meant to finish the altar cloth and send six bottles of wine to Sister Borgia for her dyspepsia. I want to send six bottles of wine to Sister Borgia, Father Connolly. Now don't let me forget. Cornelia's voice made short turns and tilted over and crashed. Oh, Mother. Oh, Mother. Oh, Mother. Oh, Mother. I'm not going, Cornelia. I'm taken by surprise. I can't go. You'll see Hapsy again. What about her? I thought you'd never come. Granny made a long journey outward looking for Hapsy. What if I don't find her? What then? Her heart sank down and down. There was no bottom to death. She couldn't come to the end of it. The blue light from Cornelia's lampshade drew into a tiny point in the center of her brain. It flickered and winked like an eye. Quietly it fluttered and dwindled. Granny lay curled down within herself, amazed and watchful, staring at the point of light that was herself. Her body was now only a deeper mass of shadow in an endless darkness, and this darkness would curl around the light and swallow it up. God! 
give a sign. For the second time, there was no sign. Again, no bridegroom and the priest in the house. She could not remember any other sorrow because this grief wiped them all away. Oh no, there's nothing more cruel than this. I'll never forgive it. She stretched herself with a deep breath and blew out the light. Now let's pause for a moment and just really, in some ways, I guess to say it the best way, I know how to say it, appreciate the genius of this story. Notice that we have incredible descriptions. Start with me on page 842 as we finish this story. Um, Cordelia's voice staggered and bumped like a cart in a bad road. It's an interesting simile, right, that her voice is kind of like, uh, she, she's a daughter who knows that her mother is soon to die, right? And so there's this kind of sense of uncertainty and fear to be there at the moment when the woman who raised you is about to die. And so your voice kind of starts to do this weird thing where it's not, it's not real firm, it's not real strong, right? Notice the use of the word drifted on page 842. Um, um, she's, she's calling for Hapsi. Hapsi's uh, one of her children who has clearly passed away, right? Uh, their faces, the children's faces, will drift over her and then drift away. Then finally, she says, this is my death. And I wasn't even thinking about it. My children have come to see me die, but I can't. It's not time. And then she says it, the irony of all ironies. I always hated surprises. A few lines later at the very bottom of 842, she will say, I'm not going, Cornelia. I'm taken by surprise. I can't go. Reminding us that she early, 20 years earlier, thought she was going to die. She made her peace with her children and everything. 